Hello everyone, Kevin Carrillo here, and welcome to another episode of the Cannabinoid Connect Podcast. My guest today is Laura Drotleff, reporter for Hemp Industry Daily. Hello, Laura Drotleff. Hi, Kevin. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing excellent. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. Of course. Thank you for being on. Um, I'm excited to talk to somebody who uh, obviously is is on the front lines when it comes to industrial hemp and, and all that's happening in that space. So um, for those of you who don't know, Laura is a reporter for uh, Hemp Industry Daily. It's a great source for all the latest financial, legal, and B2B news for the hemp industry. Um, Laura, I really, I was telling you before we recorded that I really enjoy the videos that you're putting out on Hemp Industry Daily's YouTube channel. They're very informative. Thank you so much. Yeah, we just um, began doing those towards uh, the middle of, well, I guess this, this spring. And it's been a lot of fun to talk with people over video and, uh, and do some interviews that way. Yeah, is that your first time like being on camera and, and, and doing that kind of stuff? No, the first time, it's kind of new for us a little bit. Um, we wanted to expand our coverage a bit more to um, go beyond you know, print journalism. Um, and, uh, but it's been a really, um, really fun outlet for us to be able to just have conversations, have candid conversations on video with um, people within the industry and get to know um, what they're what they're going through and things that they're working on um, in that way. Yeah, well, so to tell us a little bit about um, your background first, and then we'll jump into to Hemp Industry Daily specifically mm-hmm. how long uh, they've been operating. But um, you know, have you always had an interest in in the hemp slash cannabis space, or is this new for you? Yeah, I have. I have. Um, before I came to Hemp Industry Daily, I I worked for about 20 years off and on in uh, in the agricultural space, um, working for trade media, um, writing about specialty crops mainly. And so um, when I was in that, when I was working in that uh, capacity, we were looking into cannabis coverage and and um, wanting to to uh, expand our coverage in that area so um so it's been an interest for quite a few years so was that when hemp industry daily was formed or is that when you made the jump to hemp industry daily yeah that was uh, so i came to hemp industry daily in february of 2019 and um so i've been i've been here since then and um, but prior to that i was working for another publisher um, doing some cannabis coverage. Got you. And cannabis, uh, sorry, uh, Hemp Industry Daily um, b- really launched in a formal capacity in about 2018 um, as a sister publication to Marijuana Business Daily. Okay, so that was good timing, right? Because 2018 is when the the U.S. Farm Bill was passed, which um, legalized the mass cultivation of of hemp. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, let's talk about the hemp industry. Um, First and foremost, before we dive into specific issues and topics related to industrial hemp, um, there's massive wildfires that are burning up and down California and Oregon, and they're ravaging hemp farms, destroying um, crops and whatnot. So, um, you know, I know that Hemp Industry Daily has covered some of these stories, but um, can you tell us maybe just at a high level what the what the current update is there and how many farms have been affected? You know, it's hard to know how many farms at this point have been affected. We've heard reports that several have been uh, affected in the areas where the wildfire, wildfires have broken out both in Oregon and in California. Um, and so right, yeah, right now, I mean, just in the pandemonium of everything that's happening, it's hard to know exactly how many farms have been affected, but we have, Heard that quite a few have uh, have been in those areas and they're struggling and um, and so our thoughts are definitely going out to all those farmers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
it's just, it's crazy. I've seen a lot of those videos on social media, one of which it looked like a, a fire tornado, you know, in mm-hmm. California. Did you see that? I did see that. It's so scary. It looks like a end of the world kind of <laughs> a picture. And um, yeah, I, I couldn't believe it when I saw that. It's very scary. Scary. Yeah, exactly. You almost think that that video was like created through CGI or something, but it's. it's yeah, right. Yeah nuts well yes um thoughts and prayers do go out to those farmers we hope that they um you know recover quickly and and this kind of comes to an end quickly um absolutely yeah another topic that that i wanted to touch on is that i I know hemp industry daily just recently released a a smokable hemp report in partnership with nielsen which is a you know a, a data intelligence company um so why don't you talk a little bit about that report and and what really stood out to you in terms of some of the findings that y'all y'all came through yeah so the smokable hemp report um as you mentioned was with nielsen Uh, nielsen has a cannabis division and so we were very excited to partner with them to come out and bring bring out um some information about this the smokable hemp segment until now um, there really hasn't been a whole lot known about um, how large the segment is and um, and you know what the what the possibilities are for um, ex- expansion of the segment and so we were really excited to be able to break that down and look at um, market size estimates and uh, look at the demographics for um, the consumers what kind of consumers are using smokable hemp? And um, in addition to that, um, how how the industry could potentially broaden that reach into other demographics. So but I thought that was really interesting. I also thought what was, um, it was exciting to see the crossover between um, smokable hemp consumers and um, and tobacco consumers and how, you know, the, there's been a little bit of conversion of um, tobacco consumers using smokable hemp products. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was quite interesting. And um, the report really breaks down several different demographics and um, market size opportunities and also some of the challenges, including um, some of the regulatory, regulatory uh, issues in, in the different states. Um, you know, several different states have different rules. I mean, like every every other <laughs> segment within the CBD industry, um, there's just a, a patchwork of, of state rules nationwide. So, um, so yeah, it was really interesting digging into, um, into the data, but then also talking to some attorneys and finding out where we are on the state front and then also um, on the federal regulatory front. And and I'm glad you brought the the federal regulatory point up because um, for for the listeners that may not know, um, the reason why there's so much interest around uh, smokable hemp is due to the smokable hemp ban that's that's been proposed. Is that right? Well, I, there hasn't. I mean, there hasn't really been a federal regulatory ban yet. I mean, there that I've heard of. There, I haven't seen anything in regard to um, a federal ban. Um, re- I, I think you may be talking about the DEA uh, Delta 8 issue. Is that is that right? Well, that's, that's separate, but I, I guess I should be more specific in terms of not nationwide, not at the federal regulatory level, but at mm. the local level. I, I, I know Texas for sure has yeah. that, but have there been other states that have also followed suit? And if yeah. so, what is the reason why? Why are they doing that? Okay, so yeah, there have been several states. Um, Texas is talking about it right now. There's legislation ongoing, or um, there has been um, regula- regulation put in place to ban smokable hemp within Texas, and the industry is fighting that currently. Also, um, that is occurring in Indiana. Indiana has instituted a ban, and um, there are um, the industry is also fighting that. Louisiana. Um, and then there's, yeah, there are a few, a few different states that have banned smokable hemp uh, on the state level from all the way from manufacturer to possession. Um, some states like uh, it, Iowa, for example, has, they have statutes in order that will fine consumers for even possessing smokable hemp. Um, and, and 
consumers could even potentially go to jail uh, for a certain amount of time if they have smokable hemp uh, in possession. So um, the reason, you know, a lot of the opponents of smokable hemp are saying that there are, um, it's just too confusing. It blurs the lines between hemp, which is a, le a federally legal product, uh, federally legal crop, and marijuana, which is not federally legal because it looks the same, it smells the same, you know, in a lot of in, in smokable hemp uh, segment, a lot of those products are are formulated the same. You know, there's they're smoking the product um, like you would a joint. So it's very difficult for law enforcement, they say, to be able to determine the difference between marijuana and hemp. And some of the um, the law enforcement agencies in those different states that have tried to ban it have said that, you know, when they make a uh, drug bust for larger issues, like, you know, more serious schedule one drugs, um, then a lot of times they'll, they say that they'll, they'll smell the marijuana and then, you know, that leads that sometimes and ends up leading to a larger, uh, a larger drug bust for other, other materials. So, um, so that is sort of where we are is in terms of what the what the uh, opposition is to smoke hemp. So, so I, I just want to make sure that I'm following. So, like at the state level, these states that are deciding to propose this ban, it's it's basically because they're correlating the hemp plant with the marijuana plant. Mm -hmm. Though federally legal hemp derived plants are legal to grow and sell at a mass less scale. Right, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, hemp is federally legal. Um, and then in most states, it's also legal to sell hemp products in those states. Some states, like these states that are trying to ban smokable hemp, have different, you know, the, all, all of the states have, have a patchwork of laws. Uh, regarding CBD products. Um, some have banned CBD in edible products and, you know, to be put into food or dietary supplements. And other states have not and have uh, left, uh, left that open for manufacturers and entrepreneurs to, to pursue those, those different areas freely. It just seems interesting because on the uh, on the industrial hemp side, when you're when you're growing massive massive amounts of hemp derived plants, um, there's so many um, steps for testing that are involved, right? I mean, you even have to go as far as have third party testers and samplers come in. So it's just interesting to me that it's heavily regulated on the massive scale side, um, but when it comes to the authoritative side, like you said, like within police department, not being able to really decipher between the two, you think that they could just work together because that re those regulations are already in place. Yeah, you'd think so. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we're hoping that, you know, eventually we'll get to that, that point in history. But um, right now, there's just so much uncertainty regarding uh, where we are with CD and um, the industry is hoping to see some, you know, some regulate or some, uh, yeah, well, regulation and some rules from FDA so that we can have a broad framework nationwide, and um, and have uh, have rules that apply to to every state so that we don't have to have such a patchwork of different laws. Right. Yeah, I know that that we've been waiting on on the FDA's rules for a while, and so I guess that leads to a good question: like, how does the FDA regulate tobacco? You know, tobacco rules, and I mean, when it comes to smokable tobacco. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I'm not well versed, probably, in tobacco uh, regulation. I do know that just from the smokable hemp side that, you know, if, if um, there are, I mean, there are concerns that um, if someone were to be using a product uh, that could be construed as a, a tobacco type of product, you know, um, that it could be regulated as tobacco. But um, that's all just a jumble of different laws that, you know, I'm 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 not a, an attorney, so it's really difficult to to decipher. But we did have, you know, we do have some information in the report regarding 
how, you know, some of the, those different FDA uh, regulations that could potentially even apply to CBD if, um, if smokable hemp manufacturers were to use some products um, like let's say like a device or uh, another type of product that would be used in a tobacco product, then it's, it's possible that the FDA could say, oh, hey, that may need to be regulated as a tobacco product. But it's, yeah, it's, it's really a blurry, blurry area and uh, not definitely not something that we want to call attention to. Um, and, you know, um, hopefully, Hopefully we'll get a little bit more clarity, um, but but from what I've heard from attorneys, we're not um, we're not there yet, and they don't really um, expect to see anything right away from FDA on the smokable hemp side until there's more like more general direction and um, and guidance for the entire CBD segment. Hmm. I would I would imagine that also the vape crisis of 2019 didn't maybe even was the the driver of, of maybe some of this this thought right i mean that was a big issue that i know that y'all cover in the report um that's mm -hmm. so yeah um yeah so yeah that happened I, I know that the fda is sort of on guard because of what happened with the vape crisis and um in light of that, you know, they may be a little bit more concerned in the near term with CBD vapes than with like loose smokable flour or um, or like derived products like pre-rolls and that sort of thing. So um, they uh, they have done testing and and um, on uh, CBD vape cartridges in their sampling pool, and they're continuing to to test some of those different products. So, um, you know, it's, it's a concern for FDA. Absolutely. Well, outside of the challenges, let's talk about like the demographics and the opportunities that smokable hemp that's, that's outlined in the report. So, um, I thought it was interesting when you looked at, um, you know, uh, education level, you know, work background, like all that type of stuff. And there was a lot of cross was there not? Yeah, you know, as far as like, um, it, as far as like salary goes or that sort of thing, like it didn't really, there wasn't a whole lot of um, um, difference in terms of, you know, um, people with different salaries and how much they're spending on smoke oil hemp. But there was, there was some difference in like age range and uh, gender, um, like some of the younger, the younger uh, consumers in the 21 to 34 year old age range were tended to be more um, more likely to buy smokable hemp and it and it went down as as consumers got older and then um, you know males tend to be um, larger customers of smokable hemp products as well and then yeah in terms of um, like education levels um, yeah it wasn't like it wasn't a really big huge discrepancy but um, it seemed that people who had high school degrees and some college or associate degrees were larger users, users than people who did not have high school degrees or bachelor's degree holders or, or like more professional degrees so it was, it was kind of interesting to see how that broke out and then occupation level um, uh, yeah blue collar workers seem to be the biggest consumers of smokable hemp as well as, um, but then, you know, that also is true of people in professional management positions. So sure. it is kind of inter interesting. There's not a whole lot of discrepancy, but, um, but, but where there was, it was, it was interesting to see how that broke out. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the financial numbers, right? So some of the projections that Neil lists, in terms of the economic impact, I think I remember reading that like from 70 to 80 million, it's expected to grow from 70 to 80 million in 2020 to 300 to 400 million in 2025. Um, yeah. So let's break that down a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, in terms of that, I mean, so right now that's a huge, huge uh, opportunity for growth, right? I mean, that it can grow by five times within the next five years. Um, but if you look at, you know, so that that's really significant. Um, 
looking at the different categories, um, like the, the markets currently for CBD flour and then CBD um, smokable hemp, CBD pre-rolls and other products are, are each currently like $35 million, 35 to $40 million. Um, but comparing like smokable hemp in itself in that segment to all hemp derived CBD, um, so all, all CBD, um, that market is um, 1.2 billion for 2019 and it is expected to grow um, uh, quite a bit to, you know, within to six to seven billion dollars um, by 2025. So, so the smokable hemp market will, will represent roughly 5% of the total CBD market by 2025. Wow. And of all those uh, for, forms or uh, formulations or ways of, of which you can consume, what is the most um, that is representative that's going to grow? Of the different um, smokable hemp or uh, CBD? CBD. So like, is it edibles? Is it topicals? Like, did, does, does that, you said that um, smokable hemp is going to represent 5%. So what's the largest piece of the pie? Well, we, are, we actually have another report coming out later <laughs> um, about smokable, or excuse me, about CBD and retail and how, you know, what the, what the, um, market opportunity is for CBD and retail. So that will be coming out. Um, right now, from what I've heard, topicals is a, is a huge growth area within the industry. But then also, yeah, edibles have a, quite a bit of uh, opportunity as well, depending on what happens with, C with uh, FDA and um, regulation there from, you know, a lot of people within the industry have been saying, once we get some clarity on regulation, then, um, you know, we'll likely see some of these larger CPG companies come into the market. So, um, yeah, so it really kind of remains to be seen what, what happens in the broader CPG category and what some of the larger uh, opportunities are. But yeah, I mean, definitely, I think it all kind of hinges right now on on where and on what happens with, with FDA regulation. Mm -hmm. Well, I look forward to reading that report. Uh, is that supposed to come out Thanks. this year or next year? That'll be out this fall. This fall. Okay. So there you go. Sneak preview. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so switching gears a little bit, Laura. Um, this is going to be a very broad question, but I mean, I know that you've talked to a lot of people on the, on the YouTube channel for Hemp Industry Daily and, and, and you do a lot of uh, articles that you're writing covering different farmers. So nationwide, are you seeing uh, more hemp growing for cannabinoid extraction? So for like, we were just talking about CBD products or going for the industrial hemp side, um, you know, by separating the fiber and herd for material goods? So right now, the largest share of hemp farmers are growing for CBD. Um, that's, you know, that's where they're seeing the cash cow, you know, that's where they're, they're hoping that they can make the, the big bucks, right? Um, uh, there has been some conversion um, of some of those different farmers growing other cannabinoids like CBG and CBN, but those are still up and coming cannabinoids. And so they don't really represent as much of a market share as CBD. Um, it's also a little bit difficult right now to get genetics specifically for um, like CBN, for example, or CBC. There are genetics available for CBG production. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely going to be a growth area. Some of the different, the, the minor or novel cannabinoids are going to continue to be a growth area. On the industrial side, um, there has been quite a bit of interest in grain and fiber, um, growing fiber varieties for um, for the industrial production. And um, I mean, from what I've heard, just um, anecdotally nationwide, there have been quite a few growers who have been uh, looking at that and and planting some fiber varieties. Um, for example, in North Carolina, I've heard that you know a large majority of the of the growers in North Carolina were growing for CBD, but um, because of some of the different politics involved in that state, um, they're 
starting to try to bring the fiber varieties in and switch over a bit more to industrial production. So that will be, it really, I think will be interesting to see in the next year or two um, where, where the breakout is and how that all shakes out because I, I, I have seen quite a bit of interest among growers and people within the industry about um, growing, um, growing industrial or excuse me, fiber varieties for industrial purposes. And I think especially with the coronavirus happening um, and some of the challenges with getting materials from overseas, um, there's quite a bit of interest in developing the manufacturing side uh, of, well, manufacturing in America and using hemp to, to make some of those products that have been, um, that, we've, that we've needed that have been in short supply. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot that I want to unpack here. So I'm glad you brought up a lot of great points. Uh, mm -hmm. The first of which is that it seems like it would be a natural pivot for a farmer, um, especially if they have lots of land. Um, mm -hmm. Fiber varieties for industrial hemp purposes. And the reason for that is because it's, it's just from, from the guests that I've talked to, um, and the growers that I've met with, it's just an easier thing to do as opposed to, you know, really taking care of the plant and being delicate because of the trichome and, and what and the terpenes in terms of in terms of extraction purposes for cannabinoids, right? Mm -hmm. Especially some states like Texas, where there is so much land out here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, before like, so that's, that's kind of clear. And I think that that, that pivot will be taken in the next couple of years as, as farmers start to realize this more and more, um, because really any type of, um, growing for extraction for cannabinoids really should be done indoor, right. Or, or within greenhouses, um, for the best type of quality and harvest. Uh, yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Keep no, going. Go ahead. Um, well, yeah, I think um, there is there is be some research being done regarding that, and you know, the um, we looked at um, the acreage, uh, the number of licenses, and um, the number of acres that were li that were licensed nationwide this year, and in um, it looks like the square footage of greenhouses is def uh, licensed greenhouses is definitely increasing. Um, and like, like I was mentioning before, in North Carolina, um, I know that, you know, a lot of that smokable hemp market, um, I've, I've been told, is moving into the indoor, indoor production, um, whereas some of the outdoor acres are being converted to fiber production. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a debate regarding, you know, whether indoor or versus outdoor is best for, um, for cannabinoid production. I think, you know, it just depends on the, who you are in the industry and what you do. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely merits to both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the climate you're in, right? I mean, that's, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. I mean, greenhouses, um, the theory is greenhouses provide the ability to grow year round. So you can have, you know, have those year round harvests for smokel hemp flower, for example, and really good craft, uh, craft flower. But then, you know, there's also farmers who say that can, that can be achieved outdoors too. So it's hard to know right now. <laughs> Such a new industry. Sure. Well, I, here's what's interesting is I, uh, I didn't even think about this. I, I recently had Julia Jacobson on, who's the CEO of Aster Farms. And she brought up an issue that I didn't even think about when it comes to the relation between the THC grow operation and this newly, you know, industrial hemp uh, market that's about to emerge, right? And she was mm -hmm. talking about the issue of cross-pollination concerns. Uh, mm -hmm. If these, if they're both outdoor grows and they're too close to each other, um, there may be uh, concerns of like, you know, the, the, the plants of the THC getting pollinated and then ultimately being destroyed. Uh, the zone mm -hmm. that local governments are going to need to consider, or like we were talking about that move to indoor for THC grow operations. Yeah. So um, I know that that has been a big issue in California and also in Arizona, like some of the um, marijuana growers have not 
you know, have have pushed for some zoning laws and um, to try to to um, keep, I guess, keep uh, hemp farms from being located too closely to their farms, um, especially because right now hemp genetics are so unstable that uh, in a lot of cases, hemp farmers may get seed that is not fully feminized. You know, that's that's been pretty common over the last few years. So, um, so marijuana farmers and growers have been very concerned about that cross pollination um, from from fields of hemp that are not stable um, into their flower and completely ruining their flower. And then also on the on the hemp side for CBD, you know, um, that that will certainly be an issue as well as as industrial hemp farms begin to grow and and become larger. How do you keep that? How far do, do farms need to be away from each other um, to keep CBD flowers from being, or CBG flowers from being cross pollinated? So, yeah, it's certainly an issue. I know that um, Virginia Tech University has, has received a grant from USDA to study how far pollen can drift. And so uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the update is on that. I think it was towards the end of last year that they received that grant. So but that's, that's the kind of uh, research that needs to really be done within the industry um, to find out, you know, just, just what we're dealing with, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, another, another issue um, that's apparent, and, and we, we talked about this earlier, that it's, it's, it's fairly, um, it's it's fairly easy or simple to grow, um, you know, industrial hemp as opposed to the cannabinoid extraction hemp plant. Um, but and and farmers are doing that now. But the the real problem that they're facing is the lack of infrastructure. And I and I know that I watched one of your videos on YouTube with uh, Coleman Hemp Hill uh, out of Texas, which is a very appropriate last name. Shout out to Coleman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. And he was talking about that, you know, that that infrastructure needs to be in place because it's a lack of processing plants, right? The the ability to separate the fiber from the herb. Uh, so when like, have you seen any progress being made in any specific states, or is kind of everybody in the same boat right now when it comes to that? There, there has been quite a bit of progress. Um, I can't tell you exactly how many processors have been developed over the last year, but there, there have been a few in different pockets throughout the United States. I know Texas, there's a big effort in Texas to develop um, fiber, fiber production, but then also um, some infrastructure for processing of fiber, you know, fiber plants and um, uh, separating the, you know, um, that hemp herd and uh, the stock from the flower. So um, I'm not sure how many. I know that there is great interest and there is absolutely a need for that infrastructure with, throughout the United States because, um, you know, hemp, it, it costs a lot of money to, to transport hemp from, from across the country or, or across the state even. So um, if really to, to be able to have uh, have a, a decent supply chain within the United States, we need to have infrastructure and we need to have processors set up in every state. So I do believe that that is coming. I've heard quite a bit about uh, of talk about people who are wanting to set up uh, hemp processing plants and decorticators to be able to develop that fiber supply chain. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure where we are yet. I do think that there's going to be a huge amount of infrastructure development in the next few years. That's, that's, that's encouraging to hear. Yeah. Um, because there's so much potential and opportunity, you know, both economically and, uh, sustainable wise, you know, within the, our environment, just, just for mm -hmm. capability. So it's good to hear that there's progress being made there. Uh, yeah, and I know that there are also uh, efforts uh, among different companies to develop um, products from waste that is already being produced from, you know, processors and extractors on just like for, for CBD production. There are companies that are taking the, that, the waste from the rest of the plant that's not being processed and turning it into plastics and paper and that sort of thing. So that's pretty exciting and encouraging, I think.
Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, I read an article, I think on hemp industry daily talking about the, uh, hemp derived plastic bags. You're just, I think that's what you're just mentioning uh, mm -hmm. is in which they're doing that. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, so what does the market look like outside of the U S I mean, are there any specific key players and countries that you can point to that are, that are ahead of the game, uh, when it comes to not only cultivating, but like, processing and manufacturing material goods? Yeah, I mean, the entire world is really ramping up in this industry, right? So China has been um, growing and processing hemp for, for decades, if not longer. And um, uh, Europe has been, has been processing, growing, growing fiber and grain hemp for, for years and years and years and using it in food products. And, uh, um, and that's also ramping up the European industry. They've had some hiccups recently, but there, I, I do believe that the European market is going to be huge. We actually, um, just to, to put another plug in, uh, our, another reporter just came out with a report through Hemp Industry Daily uh, on hemp in Europe. So check that out when you have a chance. And um, uh, that was Monica Marie, my, our, my fellow reporter. Um, so shout out to her, sorry for the shameless plug. <laughs> Monica, and hey, we'll put those links uh, in the description of our YouTube channel for the, those. Yeah, are, so. awesome, thank you. And then also, I mean, we've seen a lot of development within the Central American and South American markets. So we've just heard like Brazil is coming online, uh, Colombia, there's a, a huge amount of development in South America and Central America. So I think those will be really large uh, areas of production uh, globally. That's great. Um, that's good to hear. And so, you know, talking about the reports that Hemp Industry Day was coming out with, you mentioned the CBD report that's coming out in the fall, European industrial hemp port to, that Monica uh, recently produced. Shout out to Monica. Mm -hmm. uh, does Hemp Industry Daily have any plans to do a report that is totally about the supply chain companies who are driving the use of industrial hemp on a large or even small scale? We do have another, we have a whole series of reports actually that we are developing and supply chain is one that we're looking at definitely. So that um, will be coming out with a, um, I believe in the next few months, we have four or five more reports coming out before the end of the year. So supply chain is one. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's the one I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to reading. So <laughs> excellent. Excellent. <laughs> great. Well, Laura, we've covered a lot of great topics. Is there anything that's top of mind for you that you've been recently covering that you want to uh, share with, with our listeners? Well, mainly I'm just, I'm just thrilled to be able to talk with you. I've been really working on these reports as we've been talking about. And so that's really been a big focus of mine. Um, we also had a harvest outlook report that really looked at the, um, the licensing and the top seeds for production for 2020. So that, that was interesting to kind of look at the breakdown of uh, where we are nationwide with licensing. And um, of course, licensed uh, acreage doesn't necessarily trans translate to planted acreage, which doesn't translate to harvested acreage. So um, those, those numbers will be coming and we'll be looking forward to seeing where we are with 2020. But, um, but yeah, so mainly what I've been working on are the reports and I'm looking forward to digging into some of these different areas a little bit more and really being able to, you know, um, flesh out some of the topics that we've been discussing um, and, and um, provide, just provide more information. The CBD and retail uh, report that we have coming out is also with Nielsen. And so we're very excited to have partnered with Nielsen and, um, and just, you know, we're excited to be able to um, really dig down deep into some of these different topics. Absolutely. And where can people find you online uh, if they want to follow you on social media or, uh, or the website or? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking that. So, well, we're at hempindustrydaily.com um, for the, the main site. And then 
Um, on, on Twitter, you can find us at hempindaily. And um, for me, you can find me at hempid uh, uh, underscore reporter. Hemp ID underscore reporter. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, that's me. And I'll be including all that info in the uh, in the description, of the YouTube channel as well, guys. So, um, but Laura, hey, really appreciate the work and the content that you're producing for Hemp Industry Daily. Um, it's a great, like I said, a great source for financial, legal, B two B news uh, within the industrial hemp space. And uh, yeah, keep up the great work. Thanks for being on today. Thank you so much, Kevin. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me today. This is a lot of fun. Of course. And thank you for listening, guys. Bye. Bye.